they, I had them shadow an employee, which was like a plumber or an electrician or the cleaning lady, because this was a, a private school. So they all lived on campus and they had to shadow them for a week and then come back and tell me what pain points they had. And then we, I had them design a tool that would make their lives easier. And we did this over four weeks and the boys were amazed at how they could actually help someone's life become easier. And I just remember this experience where the one, the one boy made a carrying case for the cleaning ladies cleaning supplies. So she could lift it out of her cart easier. And I think it was just a year or two afterwards, I got a message and he was so excited because he was like, she's still using it today. <laughs> and I was like, yes, that's, that's the power of designing through empathy is that you're designing to make someone's life easier. It doesn't always just have to look nice. It doesn't have to be this beautiful grand, I don't know, bar that you have at your patio. It's something that's functional. Hello and welcome to Say Hi to the Future, a podcast aimed at highlighting the human side of ingenuity, clever, inventive, and original thinking. My name is Ken Tenser, CEO of Spiderworks. With me today is Megan Price, business and service designer at IBM Consulting. She's here to talk to us about her passion for diversity, sustainability, and women in design. Megan Price, welcome to Say Hi to the Future. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So Megan, we were just talking about Tom Gaddis and um, mm -hmm. I think he was an instructor of yours, John McCabe, um, really incredible design management instructors and, and, and design educators. Tell us, tell me about how you originally met them and how you got engaged in design and design education. Yeah, so I um, originally went to Savannah College of Art and Design where I met John McCabe and Owen Foster. Right. And at that time, I believe Tom had just left and um, started at uh, Columbus College of Art and Design. And so basically throughout my education, I've really been involved in communi communities and communicating um, the importance of design education through the um, footsteps of John and Owen and then um, as a sophomore in college, I um, attended my first shift design camp. And so shift design camp was co-founded by John and Owen and, and Tom Gaddis, which is where I originally then, then met Tom. Um, and shift is where I really started to get involved in the nonprofit and like startup space of design education. I kind of fell in love with this idea that um, there's more to your education and kind of building you as a designer than what you get in your university. And so from there on out, I felt like my perspective just shifted into how do I help um, other young designers kind of well round themselves or put themselves in positions that um, really sh make them shine as individuals and not just um, the path that the curriculum gives you. Um, and so Tom, John, and I, and Owen have um, really been working together ever since. Uh, I want to say that was probably 2014 when I met them, and um, a few years later, we're still still breaking the breaking the rules and pushing the the barriers of design education together. That that's that's really cool, and they're all they're all amazing. I've met them. Well, I've met Owen too at a, at a conference they put together, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about breaking the rules, I mean, in a very short period of time, you've achieved so much. I mean, you know, you, you are the youngest member of the board of directors of the World Design Organization. That, that is incredible. The first under age of 40 to hit that board. So congrats on that. Tell us about the World Design Organization. Yeah, so the World Design Organization is a um, design NGO that's a consultant to the UN. And essentially what we do is we work with UN delegates and sustainable development goals to bring design and design perspectives to help solving them. So examples of that are, there were projects where um, we worked with uh, raising the importance or the image of women in Southeast Asia, or 
um, working with the International Space Station to understand um, essentially what it means if cities grow and how space has to be more confined. But we worked with the um, International Space Station, which is such a small confined space, but it's essentially a city in itself. Um, and so we really work to bring design to all of these different um, sustainability problems and kind of work as a, non a global nonprofit um, around the world, yeah. How cool is that? Working with the space station, understanding spatial design and whatnot. So, so talk to us about design because design is obviously a lot of things. Design is not, it's not necessarily just physical, but it's how we think and how we see and how we approach problems. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I, for me, design is really, the good design is rarely seen. Um, and I think that's the importance of it is everything that someone interacts with, whether it's a service, an experience, a physical product, an interface, um, it just kind of works and it makes your life easier. And that's good design. You notice bad design when it's not working or when it makes your life harder. Um, and so design is all around us. It's everything that we interact with, um, which I think is just so incredible that as designers, we have that power to make someone's lives easier without them necessarily even realizing it or pushing how they interact with the world. I love that. So when you're talking about service design and when you're talking about people, I mean, whether, whether it's somebody going through their education or somebody working with, with a business or your business, it's really, you're stepping back and understanding all the steps they go through? Yeah, so service design is really understanding not only what the user or person going through, and I wouldn't even say, say person, it could be anything if it's an animal going through um, a service, what their experience is like, but then also understanding the back end. So how does a business or a company or anything really post that experience and make it viable and feasible. So um, it becomes not only something that can last a while, but also something that can potentially grow if the experience wants to grow. So, so we're really looking at front end and back end with service design. Very cool. So, so how do you do that in a business? Like what, what, what would I start looking at, you know, if I wanted to just, just take a step back and say, how do I engage uh, is it for people internally and externally? How would I start to engage people better? Yeah, so I think, you know, a great example that is always given in service design is a coffee shop. And so if we're designing a coffee shop, really, like, we can even go Starbucks as an example. It's how they, how you have to walk through food or walk through water bottles and coffee cups to potentially put place your order so you're having that sales experience without even really realizing it. But then it's also the idea that they were really one of the first coffee shops to really start putting people's names on coffee cups, like write, the person writing your name so you know the order is customized to you. So there's this really innate experience that makes someone feels makes someone feel personalized when they're going through and ordering their coffee. But then you have to start questioning, well, how do we actually make this work? Um, on the back end, what is that experience for an employee to have to spell someone's name right every time? Or um, I know how to make every single version of a coffee that is these magical online <laughs> coffees that people just make up. Um, and how do we kind of put on this experience that is a coffee shop, but also kind of fast food? Um, like it's not necessarily your coffee shop that is everyone's make home making baked goods. Um, and so really looking at what as a business can we, can you start to implement? So originally, you know, there was just coffee and just food. And then the experience was around the, was around the music and the, the smell of the coffee shop. Um, and then they started getting into drive-throughs and now they have an app where you can order ahead or, um, they used to have uh, games where you can download games. If you ordered a coffee, you got a free download of, a, of an app, a game on your phone to kind of extend the Starbucks experience. And so when you're looking at it from 
an internal as a business, you want to first look at what does the user want to experience or what do they need to experience to um, really surprise and delight them. But then you have to also evaluate, can we actually do this? Can we actually um, sustain offering this? Yes, it might work for a week, but over time, can we realistically write individuals' names on cups every, right every single time? And I think part of the, the specialty of service design is really, in my opinion, is, okay, what if we can't? What's our plan B? And the interesting thing is um, how you kind of step back from problems and say, okay, if this problem arises, what's the new offering? How do we train our employees to overcome this without really breaking the experience as much as possible? Um, so it's a lot of just, I wanna say process flowing and really being open and honest and collaborating internally with all of the different stakeholders that might be involved. So again, going back to Starbucks, it's working with distributors or the person who's in charge of dis distribution of goods. It's working with the person who's in charge of marketing and, and then the interior designers and kind of bringing them all into a room and looking at how do we, how do we pull this off as a team? Because a service really is the most collaborative part of design is everything coming together to put, put on a great experience. Yeah, no, no, that's, and that's so important. I mean, and you said a couple of things there that I just really want to hit on about sustainability or um, repeatability of, of the design and the service design you're doing, because I guess the flip side is if you don't, put that effort into it, if you don't make it a collaborative team effort and monitor it very closely, you can really go off the rails pretty quickly. I mean, so the yeah. positive side is great, but if, you, if you're not committed to it, wow, it can be a really, uh, you know, potentially negative experience for your, your clients. Exactly. And then a negative experience for your business growth. And so you're constantly having to evaluate key performance indicators to really understand like how are we living up to the experience that we promised ourselves and to our customers? And so where does that come from first? You say that we promise to ourselves, is there a certain kind of leader that you've engaged with that is better at um, developing design, service design? Because to me, I'm hearing a lot of empathy um, and, and a lot of understanding and, and, and for me, if I don't have empathy or understanding or desire to understand my customers and, and all the, the people that need to collaborate on the team, it's going to be pretty tough. So, so who makes the best leader in an organization, if you will, for this? Yeah, so honestly, I think it's maybe a little controversial, but I think part of it is the best leaders are the ones who aren't empathetic. And that makes the best leader in the designer to kind of transform them to being empathetic. Also, that's the power of research and kind of showing what the customer's pain points are. And um, I think, you know, at my time at Ford, I was working under Jim Hackett and he was our CEO. And um, Jim had so much empathy. He was a great design leader. And a lot of what we were able to do was kind of transform all of these other leaders to really understand that it's not just about what the business needs. It's really about creating for the customer because without a customer, there is no business. Right. And so I really truly believe that to build empathy for a customer, the true leader that supports that is the designer or researcher that's convincing non-leaders because then there's this, there's this aha moment and I've seen it a few times and it's very special when a, when you bring in a leader and they aren't necessarily so um, empathetic towards our customers. And then you bring them in and you're presenting, whether it's a, a snippet of a research um, interview or you have them in the, like sitting in the back room of a research interview. And there's this moment where they just are like, wow, I didn't realize that this little thing was actually such a pain point or that they were so excited about the fact that we spelled their name right on a coffee cup. Um, 
And there's this moment that like, then they become evangelist. And if I think that moment is more powerful than someone who is already an evangelist, because if a company can see someone flip to be more empathetic, then more people who are questioning it are going to be like, well, if that person was able to understand what, why a customer is important, well, let me try it. Okay. Maybe this makes a little more sense. It's not just these designers that are talking about design thinking and um, trying to enforce this new creative empathetic way on me. Um, and it, it sounds so intuitive, but I, I know from experience how hard it is. I mean, really all we're trying to do is, is find out what makes the customer unhappy or not delighted and flip it. And, and, exactly. and yeah, and, and it's just incredible though, how many times people will say to you, no, I know my customer. No, I know this already. And they push back and it, it it's gotta be, it's gotta be trying at times. Yes, it's definitely, it's definitely not easy work. Um, and I think as design is growing more into being into those oval office C-suite spaces, more companies are starting to really dive into this idea of working and understanding a customer. But I think one of the next big hurdles that we're going to have to go to go through is now people are saying, okay, yes, we know we need to hear customer pain points. We know we need to um, understand the customer. But they're almost using that against design in a sense where they're like, well, I have this opportunity. I have this solution. Go find me a customer pain point <laughs> so we can prove it. And they're kind of doing the reverse. And so I think that is actually going to be our next hurdle of like the pain points come first and then you ideate, then you come up with solutions. But just because you came up with the solution doesn't mean that we're going to go out and just find a pain point that proves your solution. Um, cause that's kind of the reverse and that's, that's just designing for design's sake. Then people love to be right, Megan. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And, and you know, we're, but we're coming from a world where, uh, 20, 30 years ago, it was a lot easier to be right. Um, everything exactly. was moving more slowly. The horizon was, which was much further out. So when you're talking about um, communicating or engaging with a customer, for me, that seems more of um, an ongoing process, something you'd want to build into your company rather than, hey, once a year, you're going you're gonna to sit behind a glass and listen to a few people talk. It, it just seems like, yeah, to keep up with this very short horizon we live in, design is that much more important. Yes, it's definitely something, I mean, realistically, you should be talking to your customer every time you make a change, every time you have an idea, anytime you want to innovate or, um, yeah, change something like that, you should go, you should go talk to your customer. Your customer should never be someone that you just talk to once a year, because I mean, if you think about yourself, like how much do you change in one year? Maybe your favorite song in the beginning of the year is, I don't know, some country song. And now at the, it's summer and you're like, mm, I'm feeling more rock and roll. Um, and like, um, so things change constantly. And especially in a world like today where, you know, none of us saw the pandemic coming and then none of us saw it continuing. Well, I think some of us saw it continuing to like resurface and come in waves. And, um, and so there's things that are constantly changing the way humans work react in a world. And so I think research needs to constantly be keeping up with that idea of um, just values constantly changing. Yeah, it almost, I mean, the pace of change really lends itself to those who listen and do more often. Yes, um, absolutely. So you, you do something around global design education um, and startups. Is that can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I have, so like I said earlier, I, I started attending Shift Design Camp in my sophomore year. And because I was seeing so much growth of myself 
while I was attending as a camper, I started to talk to John and Owen about, and Tom about creating um, more of a leadership position for me in this organization. And so- Sorry, Matt, around me, you, yeah. what, what is SHIFT? Tell us what SHIFT is and what the camp is about for, for the yeah. listeners. <laughs> so SHIFT Design is a camp in, um, founded in Alabama. And the whole idea of it is it's working with your mind, soul, and body to, which, uh, yeah, to kind of develop you as a designer or as a human um, to be ready for the professional field. And so it's combining designers and business majors with engineers and writers and all, any kind of um, education can come. And it's actual camping um, in about 3000 acres in Alabama and there's no technology. And so a lot of it is you're going through these design challenges or thinking challenges, but you don't have the comfort of being able to Google the solution or to look <laughs> up inspiration. And a lot of your materials are just what you can find in the woods. And so some of the challenges are very engineering based, like build a trebuchet, but you don't actually know how to do that because you have no instruction. So you're just trying to figure out, like, I think I know what this is. And you're really using your, your brain to figure out engineering without directions. Um, but then some of them are a lot more, a lot more social where we were building um, carnival experiences for the deaf and blind and really trying to understand like what is a carnival experience for someone um, with different abilities than our own. And not only that, you're collaborating with people who are from different countries, from different degrees and backgrounds. And so there's this sense of learning how to be a better teammate as well. And so you're really learning the social aspects of design and collaboration um, in an unfamiliar, uncomfortable environment because it's camping, like there is no glam. <laughs> it's just, you're just in the woods, you're kind of muddy and it's just, you're trying to network and socialize. And the thing that I love about it is they really take away all of the pressures of what a designer is. Um, and I, I put quotes around that because, or quote, ex whatever uh, expressions around it, because I think now we're moving to this phase where design is seen on Instagram as beautiful renders and beautiful sketches. And it's all these people accomplishing amazing things and they're, they're, great, um, they're great at presenting themselves. Um, and so there's this intimidation when you graduate that you need to have this great ability to sketch and put it on Instagram and get thousands of likes or render these really beautiful products. And at Shift, we really focus on what your, what your um, specialty is and what your skill set is and how do we highlight that? And then you have, you're surrounded with all these other people who um, acknowledge your, I want to say your weakest part. It's not even a weakness. It's just your weakest part. And they're there to support you in building that up in a comfortable environment. An example of that is <laughs> I was really bad at public speaking. I was really shy, actually, um, about when I went into college and I never wanted to speak on stage. So when I first started attending shift camp, I would always stand in the back of my groups. I never did any of the speaking. Um, I never really had a leadership voice. And over time, John and Owen and Tom started seeing that and they started um, asking me to do little things to kind of step out of that comfort zone. So the first time that they kind of asked me to do something was literally just going to the microphone and telling people that lunch was ready. And I was so nervous just to tell people that lunch was ready. Um, and fast forward to now, it's like, I've had all these experiences where I was able to teach on that stage um, about biomimicry and speak around the campfire and, and then grow into now I support on the organization team where 
Um, in 2020, we held a digital shift camp because of COVID and not being able to be in person. And um, I was actually the one coordinating and facilitating that entire camp. And so I was able to transition what we used to have in a physical camp and understand how do we create that same experience or a similar experience, but in a digital setting. And so now I'm more involved in the the growth and the organization of shift, um, which is which has been really rewarding because I get to now give back the experience that I gained to the next generation to kind of help foster and grow and grow them. That that is so cool. Thanks for sharing. It just I think you're bringing out and you you, you talked about it before that the notion of collaboration. Um, I think historically. Um, and, and I, I went to my first round of business school a, a while ago, and, and we weren't taught to collaborate. We were taught to compete. And I'm not saying that competition isn't healthy. It is. I'll always have a competitive side. But in order to compete, you need to collaborate. You need to surround yourself with great people, I believe, at least, to, to survive today, um, uh, not just to grow as, as an individual, but as an organization. And that to me is one of the wonderful things you're describing with shift. Yeah, I, I truly, and I, I, I b truly believe that if you go to any of my old teams, um, even at Ford and now I'm at IBM, collaboration is one of my, my biggest things. And I always used to say that design is lost without a community behind it. Um, because I, personally, I would be nowhere without my community that was supporting me and putting me in in these positions, introducing me to you um, and kind of pushing me to grow into my next stage. And I think the same is with our products or what we're designing is if you aren't getting your user involved, if you aren't talking to the community that's going to be experiencing whatever you're designing, you don't have a design, it's mm -hmm. lost. Um, and so I truly, I truly believe in the power of community. And like you said, competition is healthy, but there is the sense that you should always be lifting as you as you rise. You should always be hold, pulling another hand up as you are stepping on the shoulders of the giants before you. That is that is a wonderful thought. Um, so as you say that and you talk about shift and you talk about design, there is one group, um, you lived in England for a while, there's one group that um, you, you spoke to and I'm, I'm, I'm going to preface this by saying that I have three kids and three stepkids. Half of them are boys and half are girls. Um, you worked with 12 to 18 year old boys um, yeah. on design workshops, collaboration, caring. Um, that sounds like a punishment, Megan. <laughs> 12 to 18 year old boys focusing. To, to, it, tell me about it. It definitely um, was one of the harder things I've done in my career. Mm -hmm. um, I think I learned a lot about different um, upraisings. I grew up very, um, I don't know, like, I don't want to say appreciative of like every little thing. Like someone gave me a pen and I was like, oh my gosh, a pen. Um, <laughs> And so trying to teach empathy to um, students that were just born in a different economic class than I was, mm -hmm. was um, quite a change of, of experience for me. And, and not only that, 12 to 18 year old boys that are going through puberty and learning and, and just having a lot of life changes during that time. <laughs> um, it definitely was an interesting challenge, but Honestly, I would say it was also one of my most rewarding because the schools in the UK, from what I've experienced, teach design in a very engineering focused manner. So those boys can tell you everything about a piece of wood, how it bends, how much water needs to be in it, what kind of screws you need to put into it. They can tell you about all of the elasticity of metal. Like they know the engineering side of design better than most people who are graduating with a master's in design in the US. Um, but what the school does, I was, I was Radley College, what they do is they bring 
um, Americans over from design programs to expand the mindset of what design is in America. And in America, we are taught to be more human centric. We're taught to um, think about our users and then we'll, we'll work with an engineer. We don't necessarily always have to have 100% of the engineering mindset of like material elasticity. Um, we should have an understanding of it that we can work with an engineer, but we don't need to know all of it. And so when we went over there, we were really teaching research for the first time. What, is it, what does mm -hmm. it mean to design something not for yourself or not for your mom? Um, like a lot of the times, one of their senior projects, which was so cool, was that they had to build a piece of outdoor patio furniture. And they were beautiful. I mean, this one kid built this beautiful bar that's like out of wood and metal. And he made everything by hand for his dad outside at a bar, like a, like a drinking alcohol bar. And um, so when I saw that that was their senior process, I was trying to ask them, well, what would happen if you wanted to make this bar for others? Like if we wanted to mass produce it and they were like, well, what do you mean? I would never do that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, this is design. Like, it's really great that you're spending thousands of dollars on this one bar, but if you want to mass produce it, am I going to be able to buy a multi-thousand dollar bar? Probably not. Um, and so I had to try to teach them, how do you think through empathy? So they, I had them shadow an employee, which was like a plumber or an electrician or the cleaning lady, because this was a, a private school. So they all lived on campus and they had to shadow them for a week and then come back and tell me what pain points they had. And then we, I had them design a tool that would make their lives easier. And we did this over four weeks and um, the boys were amazed at how they could actually help someone's life become easier. And I just remember this experience where um, the, one, the one boy made a carrying case for the cleaning ladies uh, cleaning supplies so she could lift it out of her cart easier and I think it was just a year or two afterwards I got a message and he was so excited because he was like she's still using it today <laughs> and I was like yes that's that's the power of designing through empathy is that you're designing to make someone's life easier it doesn't always just have to look nice it doesn't have to be this beautiful grand I don't know bar that you have at your patio it's something that's functional um, and so while it was definitely challenging, um, it was very rewarding to, to kind of see again, that, that flip of mindset that designing for someone who, um, who doesn't realize that they have a pain point, but we can make their lives easier. Thank you for that story, Megan. And as our, as our time comes to a close today, um, one last question and, you know, you've obviously achieved a lot so far. I mean, again, youngest board member of the World Design Organization, um, affiliated with the UN, working on some incredible design projects, top global achiever award at Ford. I mean, these are no small feats um, over a full career, let alone at, at the beginning part. And I'll say that because I've got a few more years in than you. How do you keep up your passion and your curiosity? I think so. My curiosity really comes from, um, I honestly, like I, I get bored and in the sense that I want to keep learning and learning things that I've never thought that I could before. I want to keep growing and surprising myself. Um, a great example of that is I never actually thought that I would get elected to the board of directors. It was an honor to be nominated and then to campaign but the competitors were incredible. I mean, I was, the people who are on the board have 40, 50 year careers. Um, and so it, it, that really surprised me. And now taking on responsibilities and meeting with government officials is again, a whole new learning um, experience for me. And I think I just find a lot of passion in surprising myself, but then also passion in bringing others up with me. And so that's where I really focus on design education because I love to the saying, a high tide raises all ships. And I just, mm -hmm. 
I really truly believe that the experiences that I got, that I was, that I achieved and received and the honors that I have been given are because I had mentors and people who were nominating me and electing me and pushing me to think bigger than what I could think of. And that's, that's where I want to do for the next generation is I want to empower them to think bigger than what they have been told that they can accomplish or what they see in their path, because I don't know, you really can achieve anything if you put your mind to it um, and you have the right community around you supporting you. Megan Price, thank you so much. What a perfect place to stop. And thank you for being on the show today. And um, a thanks to Tom, John, Owen, and uh, Alabama, yes. Owens, Alabama, um, for helping become the center of design thinking. Thank you, Megan. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. It was, it was a pleasure having this conversation. Take care.